There's a lot of exciting things taking place. We want you to be a part of it. You know, Gideon uh, was going to fight a battle that seemed unwinnable. Sometimes we face things that we, we can't win on our own. You know, the doctor says, well, you've got cancer. And you don't know how to fight it. What are you going to do? You've got diabetes, you know, and, and you, you, you're thinking, well, I, what do I do? You know, you, you, you try to do what you can, but at one point or another, you got to let God do what you can't. Amen. And Gideon was fighting a battle. He was up against great odds, outnumbered like a thousand to one. It, it seemed like an, an impossible battle to win. And God said this. He said, Gideon, if you're, if you're worried about this battle, go listen to what they're saying in the enemy's camp. And so th he snuck over with one of his uh, soldiers and they went to the border of the enemy's camp and they, and they heard two guys talking. And one of them said, I had a dream last night. He said, I dreamt that a loaf of bread rolled down this hill and crushed our tent and just laid it out flat. And the other guy said, that's nothing except the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And boy, Gideon got so excited about this dream of a loaf of bread. Now, I got to tell you, I have never gotten excited about a dream of a loaf of bread. And I couldn't understand why Gideon got excited about that. I remember, do you remember the Lay's potato chip commercials that said, no one can eat just one? One time my brother said, I'm going to try to see if I can eat just one. He ended up eating the whole bag by himself, you know. And that night he dreamt that a potato chip was attacking him. I don't know if it was a dream or if it was really attacking him. You know, I mean, it just, but I don't usually dream about, you know, a loaf of bread or a potato chip. <laughs> but Gideon was hearing this dream about a loaf of bread and he got excited. And I thought, why did he get excited? Well, if you go back a little bit and you read, see, Gideon was, had a visitation. It looked like the Lord came and visited Gideon. And Gideon said, before you leave, wait, I want to bring something to you. And Gideon brought him an offering. And see, Gideon was a wheat farmer. He grew wheat for a living and he, and he sold wheat to make bread. And part of the offering that, given, that Gideon had given to the Lord was a loaf of bread. And then I realized why Gideon got so excited. See, what he was seeing in that dream was his offering. See, his offering in the hands of God became a weapon against his enemies. Whoo, did you hear what I said? Your offering in the hands of God becomes a weapon against your adversaries. Then I realized why Gideon was so excited, because that was so powerful. You see, God says, give and it shall be given unto you. In other words, whatever you sow, God says it's going to come back to you. See, Gideon was seeing his offering again. And his offering was winning the battle for him. I want to tell you something. We're, we're going to get ready to receive this morning's tithes and offering. But I want you to know something. You will see your offering again. Whatever you give today, you're going to see it again. Say this. Say, I will see my offering again. No matter what you give, you're going to see it again. God, you have God's word on that. He said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over you're not only going to get back what you sow, but you're going to get back after you sow, and you're going to get back more than you sow. Amen. You will see your offering again. So ushers, if you would, I want us to pass out the offering envelopes. Everyone get an offering envelope. Let your son, your daughter, everyone get an envelope. And the first thing I'd like you to do is to turn the envelope over, and on the back side, write down any prayer requests that you might have. If you're visiting with us today, make sure you uh, include your email address on the offering envelope so we can have a record of your visit and let you know about events that are coming up. Of course, those that are watching online, yeah, there's many ways you can give. The easiest way to give is just to simply text your offering to 940-241-4450. The number should be on your screen, 940-241-4450. In fact, if you're here in the sanctuary, you can text your offering that way also. But I still want you to fill out that offering envelope. And if you have a prayer request, write it down on the back of that envelope. Of course, you can always go to our website and give that way. And if you want to take some offering envelopes home with you, let us know because we have plenty. And you can mail your offering in during this time that a lot of people are staying home and sheltering in place. Uh, some have called and said, hey, would you mail us some offering envelopes? Because we want to be able to mail our offering in and our tithe in. So you can mail your offering in. The address is 806 Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas. And the zip is 77339. You can go to our website, clc-church.com, clc-church.com. And click on the Give button. The menu will drop down and you can give through PayPal that way. Of course, the easiest way to give is to simply text the number, uh, uh, text the name out to the number on your screen, 940-241-4450. If you're writing a check, just write it out to CLC. If you're giving with your check card or your credit card, debit card, just fill out all the information, include your expiration date and your phone number. And let's pray over this morning's offering. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to return a portion of that that you've blessed us with. Take this offering we're about to receive and multiply it. Let it meet all the needs of the church. Lord, let it be enough and to spare. Lord, answer every prayer, heal every hurt. And Lord, let your will be done in and through our lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And everyone said, Amen, Amen. Now prepare your offering and ushers whenever you're ready. You can receive this morning's tithes and offering. I want to share a message with you this morning that I've entitled, What About Me? I want you to say that with me. Say, What About Me? Say it again. Say, What About Me? Amen. John chapter 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, open our spiritual eyes and ears. Let us receive from heaven. Let your word be spoken. Let your will be done. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much for being here today. I want to talk to you today about surviving, about overcoming. Amen. And I don't mean just surviving 2020. Hello. That's a challenge enough. But surviving life in general, overcoming challenges that we face in everyday life. You know, there's been so much unrest and turmoil this year and in our world. There's accusations of hate and racism flying all around. People are rioting and pulling down statues. And it, it seems a little strange to me because I've never seen a statue hurt anyone. I've never seen a statue, uh, you know, start a fight or, or strike anyone. But how can we get free from all this turmoil? And it's not just the problems in the world today, but turmoil that's going on in, in individuals in their own life. Battles that they face inwardly. Problems with our own family, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our brothers and sisters. In our opening text, Jesus is speaking about being set free. And he wasn't simply talking about someone who is maybe locked up or incarcerated, uh, physically uh, bound, but... He's talking about sp uh, people that were in bondage mentally or spiritually as well as physically. He's speaking about total freedom. And I, I think, you know, part of what I think of when I think of total freedom is peace. Just living in peace. Amen. I think it was Rodney King years ago that said, can't we all just get along? Hello. Can we just have peace and be free from all this condemnation? You know, you've heard me speak on this topic before, but. Years ago, the, the famous songwriter and singer John Denver uh, sang a song, and it, it, part of the words, part of the lyrics said, Sunshine on my shoulder makes me happy. Sunshine in my eyes can make me cry. It's a pretty song. I can't do it justice. Sunshine on the water looks so lovely. Sunshine almost always makes me high. It's a pretty song, but it's not the truth. I mean, it's just, it sounds good, but the truth is all the sun does is shine. Amen. I mean, it's just a big ball of fire, magma out there in space, and all it does is shine every day. It doesn't make you happy. It didn't make John happy. Who made John happy? Well, John made John happy. Amen. Amen. See, some people say, oh, the sun gave me sunburn. The, the sun made me sweat. The, the sun gave me cancer. No, it didn't. The sun's just shining. You're the one that decides whether to get out in the sunlight. Hello. The sun doesn't make you happy. It doesn't make you sick. It doesn't make you tan. That's your choice. Come on, somebody. The reason I tell you that is because we often tell ourselves a lie. And if you believe the lie, you're never going to be set free. But Jesus said, if you know the truth, it's interesting, he said, you shall know, the word know in the, in the Hebrew is, is gnosko, or, or it may even be Greek, gnosko, it means to be acquainted with. In Spanish we have words, it says gnosko, it means to know somebody, to be acquainted with somebody. And Jesus said, you will gnosko, or gnosko the truth, and, and, and the truth that you know will make you free. And the more truth you know, the more free you're going to be. You learn the truth about salvation, you get saved. You learn the truth about healing, you get healed. You learn the truth about sowing and reaping, then you're going to start sowing, you're going to start reaping. Amen? And the more truth you know, the more free you're going to be. Amen? It's nice to hear John say sunshine makes him happy, but the truth is John makes John happy. All the sun does is shine. Amen? A lot of times people would rather fix the blame than fix the problem. People don't like to take... It's hard to find somebody that you say, well, you know, what happened here? And they say, well, that's my fault. I wasn't paying attention or, you know, I got a little lazy. 
Today it's rare to find people that will actually own up to their own problems. I remember years ago at home, I can't remember what happened, something happened and I, I was going to get on to my kids about it. I, 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 something like, you know, they left the milk out all night, you know. And I remember I said, kids, who left the milk out all night? And my oldest son, Anthony, he said, Josh. <laughs> I said, Anthony, Josh didn't spend the night here last night. He said, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I was like, he, he didn't know who did it. He was, just, it. he was just blaming somebody as long as it wasn't him. Hello, Josh. I said, Josh wasn't here. Aaron, you know, just anybody. We just don't want to take credit ourselves. Hello. But if it's not our problem, then it's not going to be our victory. If it's not our battle, then it's not going to be our win. Amen. Jesus said, if you'll confess your faults, hello, one to another, and pray one, another, one for another, then you may be healed. You know, you'll often hear people say things like, well, uh, yeah, I beat my wife, but I'm, but I'm not a wife beater. <laughs> well, it looks like you are. <laughs> Hello. Well, no, wait, she, she pushed my buttons. She made me do it. Lie. That's not the truth. They made me lie. Lie. That's not the truth. See, the truth makes us free. They make me so angry. Nope, that's impossible. No, Pastor, really, they did. They made me so angry. That's impossible. They beat Jesus over the head, put a crown of thorns on him, spit in his face, plucked the beard out of his face, nailed him to a cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He prayed for them. He was in total control. No one can make you angry but you. No one can make you happy but you. See, when you learn the truth, then the truth will make you free. But so often we want to, well, they, they made me angry. They made me do it. You've heard me say this before. You know, the reason I'm overweight is because obesity runs in my family. No, the reason you're overweight because nobody runs in your family. I'll be honest with you. I used to believe something that is just totally wrong. I used to believe that the reason I was overweight is because Lisa is a good cook. And it's true. She is a good cook. But she has never, in our, you know, 30 plus years of marriage, she has never forced food down my throat. Hello. She makes, she can really bake. She can make good cookies and cakes and pies, and I love pie. But I've never woken up, you know, from my sleep with her stuffing a pie down my throat. No, it's never happened. I have total control over what I eat. Hello. If I'm overweight, it's my fault. And see, we have to take ownership of our own problems. See, Jesus said, you'll know the truth. And when you, when you learn the truth, then the truth will make you free. Amen. We got to quit pointing our fingers at other people. And, you know, God is so good. He, he made it to where when we point at somebody, we got three more fingers pointing back at us. Hello. We always want to fix the blame, but we really need to be fixing the problem. Amen. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I'm not messy. I just don't have time to clean. Lie. <laughs> but pastor, I really don't have time. We all have the same time. We all have 24 hours a day. Hello. The only difference is what we do with the time that we're given. Amen. That's the truth. See, I want to help you to get your breakthrough. I want, I want to help you to find peace. But the first thing you have to learn is that it's the truth that makes us free. And that stuff that you've been telling yourself is not the truth. See, there's a story in the Bible about a couple of brothers. In fact, they were twins, Jacob and Esau. Grew up in the same home. They had the same parents. They were the same age. They ate the same food, lived in the same house, grew up in the same neighborhood. When it rained, they both got wet. Amen. The main difference between the two were the choices that they made in life. Let, let me just read a little bit about them. This is from Genesis chapter 27, beginning at verse 1. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eye as were dim, so that he could not see, he called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. He said, Behold, now I'm old, and I know not the day of my death. In other words, he said, Look, I'm getting old, and I, I'm going to die soon. I don't know when. Now, therefore, take, I pray thee, thy weapons, and thy quiver, and thy bow, and, and go out in the field, and take me some venison. He said, Go hunting, son, and, and get a deer. He knew he was a good hunter. He said, and make me some savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat and my soul may bless thee before I die. He said, son, called his oldest son. He said, son, look, I know I'm going to die soon. I'm getting old. I'm in poor health. And before I die, I want to bless you. So I want you to go hunting and get a deer. I know you can do it. 
and dress it for me and cook some that meat the way I like the way you cook it, you know, and, and bring me some. So I'm going to eat that nice meal and I'm going to just bless you. Amen. I want to pronounce a blessing over you. And, and so Esau went hunting and uh, decided to do what his dad asked him to do. Amen. But see, Esau's mother wanted Esau's brother Jacob to get the blessing, not Esau. So while Esau's out there doing what his father asked him to do, Jacob's mom devised a plan to fool dad and get the blessing to Jacob instead of to Esau. She told Jacob, go out and kill a goat right away and bring it in and, and, and we'll cook it the way uh, we know dad likes. It'll taste like venison, that goat, it's going to taste like venison. And then go and put some of uh, Esau's clothes on because I want you to look like and I want you to smell like your brother. I mean, you're already twins. You already look alike, but your dad will know the difference because, you know, your brother's a man of outdoors. He, he likes to wear that camouflage, you know, and he's always got the smell of, you know, game because he's always out there hunting. So I want you to have that same smell because your dad will know. We've got to fool your dad. And your brother's hairier than you are, so put some skin on your, on your, on your neck and on your hands so that if your dad reaches up to he'll feel it be hairy, you know. He, we want to fool your dad and steal the blessing. So while Esau's out there doing what his father asked him to do, his brother's in here conniving with mom to steal the blessing. And in Genesis 27, verse 20, it says, And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? He said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. Lie. <laughs> And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou be my very son Esau or not. Isaac was a little suspicious. Well, I don't know, something about this one doesn't sound like Esau, you know. And Jacob went near unto Isaac, his father, and his father touched him. And he said, uh, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he didn't realize, so he discerned him not that, that he was being fooled because his hands were hairy and he seemed like his brother Esau's hands. And so he blessed Jacob instead of Esau. Wow. And, and what had just taken place was terrible. Jacob deceived his own father, stole his brother's blessing by sneaking and doing underhanded things. The birthright of the first, uh, firstborn was a double portion of, of what the parents would leave him. Twice as much would go to the firstborn. They would really have an advantage. But now Jacob stole this from his dad. And in Genesis 27, verse 30, it says, And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came from his hunting. And he also had made savory meat, and he brought it unto his father and said unto his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's venison, that your soul may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said to him, Who are you? He said, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. You know, you just told me to go hunting. You told me to bring you some venison. And I, I just did what you told me, Dad. And uh, Isaac said, where is he that has taken venison and brought it to me? And I've eaten it before you came. And I have blessed him. And he will be blessed. His dad said, wait a minute, somebody came before you and, and they gave me some, some meat to eat, and, and I bless them, and they're going to get the blessing, because when I give my word, I keep it. Can you believe it? I mean, Esau was out there doing what his father called him to do, and his conniving mom and brother steal his blessing. Can you imagine that? And Esau still has the bow and arrow close by, and he says, you know what? I know my father's near death, but when he dies, I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. That no good for nothing, been stealing stuff from me all my life. He's been a thorn in my side. Whoa, when dad is not here anymore, I'm going to kill him. Whoo! Because Jacob's the reason for all my problems. Can you imagine how Esau felt? I mean, think about it for a second. Can you imagine for a second how Esau felt? He's out there doing what dad called him to do. And this no good for nothing goes and steals his blessing. Can you imagine that? I mean, I'm really asking. I'm asking if you can imagine that because I think you can. Because I've talked to people that have been through very similar things. See, you've been out there going to church and paying your tithes and helping out in the church. And, and you're at church every Sunday and you're at church every Wednesday. And you can't even get your car fixed. But your neighbor out there that's selling drugs and getting drunk every weekend, he's got a brand new car. 
And see, Esau said, hey, Dad, what about me? Do you have a blessing for me? I mean, I was out there doing what you called me to do. Somebody say, what about me? Come on, say it. Say, what about me? I mean, that's what he was asking. Hey, Dad, what about me? I mean, I was doing what you told me to do. And you blessed that no good for nothing? <laughs> you ever been in a situation like that? You know, you're trying to eat right. You're eating all your vegetables. You quit eating pies. You quit drinking soft drinks. You started going to the gym three times a week, trying to lose weight. And after a month of this torture, you weigh yourself and you gain two pounds. And then that coworker, you know, that's sleeping with a different guy every week comes in and says, Whoo, I've been drinking Slim Fast and I lost 10 pounds this week. And you go, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> You go, girl. You go. You go right in the middle of the street and let somebody hit you with a car. You know, you. Hey, God, what about me? I mean, I've been trying so hard. I had a friend, a co-worker, uh, someone who helped me in church, a, a woman of God who loved the Lord. She was a nutritionist by occupation. She ate healthy. She would get up and run five miles every morning. She worked hard to stay in good health. Wouldn't eat anything that was bad for her. And then one day she went out of town. When she came back uh, in town, the next day she wasn't at work. I tried to find her. She was in the hospital. She died the day later. What? Yet you find your old, you know, Uncle Fred that's been drinking all his life. And he's passed out most of the time. And he eats bacon for breakfast every day. And he's 104 and still going strong. Amen. And you're like, wait a minute, God, you know, I'm doing what you, Esau was doing what his father called him to do. Have you ever, anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. What about me? Do you know how Esau felt? You're at church trying to, you know, keep your moral values and you've been a good girl. You, you, you've been supporting the church financially. You've been praying for a Christian man all, you know, all these years and, You've been good to God and, and you've been at the altars praying and fasting and prayer. God, send me a man. And you turn on the TV and you see Honey Boo Boo's mom, you know, Mama Jean got a man. And you don't. And she's getting high on cocaine. They're thinking about the rest of her cocaine. And you're like, hey, God, what about me? That's what Esau was saying. He was saying, God, what about me? My brother who lied at you. I'm going to kill that boy. That's what he said. I'm going to kill him. It's his fault that I'm in this mess. It's his fault that I have these problems. What about me? And I was thinking about that, and, and I was reading what his father told him. See, in Genesis 27, verse 38, it says, And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me even also. Father, what about me? Oh, my father. And, and, and Esau lifted up his voice, and, and he cried. And Isaac, his father, answered, and this is what he said unto him. He said, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by the sword you'll live and, and you'll serve your brother. Well, that had to hurt. You're going to serve your brother. And it shall come to pass when thou uh, shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break the yoke of your brother from off your neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. And then I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. Boy, I, I'm going to kill Jacob. Now, I don't know if he listened to his dad because he, he was saying, Dad, what about me? And his dad answered this question. He said, listen, you're going to live by the sword. And you're going you're to do okay, but it's not going to be as easy as your brother. Your brother's going to have it easy. Because I pronounce a blessing on him, he's going to get it. He said, but when you have the dominion, then you're going to break that yoke of your brother off your neck. And I thought about that. What do you mean when you have the dominion? See, because he wanted to kill Jacob. He said, I'm going to kill Jacob because it's his fault that all this has gone on in my life. It's his fault that I didn't get the blessing. It's his fault that, you know, I'm out there working all day, but I'm not getting what I need. It's his fault you know what that is? That's a lie. And we like to tell ourselves that. Well, they make me so angry. Whew. They push my buttons. Oh, they, they did this and they did that. You know what? You can't fix they. The only one you can fix is you. And if it's not your problem, 
then it's not your fix. See, if, if, they, if it's them, if they really are the ones that make you mad and they make you angry and they tick you off and they, then you can't do anything. You're just a puppet. They're controlling you. But if you finally get dominion, that means to dominate, then you get a hold of this thing and you realize that you're responsible for your own life. Hello. When you finally tell yourself the truth, hey, wait a minute. I'm going to tell you something. And, and this is something that I want, I want to be careful how I say it because I've got a brother that is blessed. I mean, just blessed. And, and, uh, and I'm happy for him. I really am. But I could see how maybe if I wasn't a, a Christian man, how I could be upset like Esau was. See, there's 10, 10 children in my family and, and we all grew up. Um, when my dad would come home from work, he always used to stop at the bar before he came home. <laughs> it was just something dad did. You know, we knew where, where he'd be. We knew where the bar was. It wasn't down, It wasn't far from the house. Later on, when we got a little older, my dad bought the bar. You know, <laughs> I remember one time we were driving home. I saw dad on the roof of the bar. I said, dad, what are you doing up there? He said, I heard the drinks are on the house. You know, <laughs> dad had a good sense of humor. And uh, some of my brothers, when we were growing up, we, we, we formed a band. I played guitar a little bit, and, and, and uh, one of my brothers was a real good singer. And uh, they told me, they said, look, you, you know, you got to make a decision. We used to go to nightclubs and play all the time. And they said, you got to decide you're going to be in the band full time or not, because I also had a job out, you know, uh, running a department store. And I thought to myself, no, I'm not going to be in the bars all the time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with this other job. I think I got a better chance of a career there. And so I kept that job. But my other brothers, they stayed playing music and in the bars. And see, one of my younger brothers, when we were, when we were very young, he had an accident on an irrigation uh, machine. Long story short, he, he had his leg cut off. And, and when, he, when his leg got cut off, mom prayed for him and said, Lord, let him be able to, you know, not have to work hard. See, we worked out in peanut fields and we did hard work. But he only had one leg now, and, and uh, he cut his foot off and had an artificial limb. And she was like, Lord, help him to get a job where he doesn't have to work so hard physically. And, and he became a singer. He had a real good voice, and he, he sang. And a lot of times when he sang, he'd sit in a stool because standing up a long time it was difficult. And, and uh, you know, later on in his life, he, he bought some acreage. He bought like 300 acres of land. And uh, lo and behold, on the land, they struck oil. He's got around 10 oil wells on that land. And I'll tell you, he's doing okay. He, he doesn't need to work. He does work. He works hard. He works harder than a lot of folks that, that don't have any physical conditions. But he's blessed. And I can see where, if I didn't know better, I could say, well, Lord, what about me? I mean, I've been in church all these years. I've been serving you and I've dedicated my life to you and I've gone into ministry and, and I spend full, all my time, you know, trying to get people saved and trying to bless the, the community and trying to lead people to the Lord. And, you know, I could have done other stuff, man. Yet how come he's got all the money and I'm over? I could have been like that. But that wouldn't have been right. And, and I'm so thankful that I was more mature than that and I, because I'm, I'm happy for him. Man, I really am. Praise the Lord. Because for a couple of reasons. Number one, my, my mom's prayers were answered. I like that. I like the fact that my mom prayed for him and, and God blessed him. Amen. And then I also realized that, hey, I'm not a stupid guy. I'm pretty smart. And if I want to open a business, I can. And if the business makes money, then it's like an oil well. What is an oil well? It's something that pumps and it, you know, it, you sell oil and it gives you money. And it doesn't matter if it's an oil well or if it's a, a coffee shop or if it's a resale shop or if it's a hardware store or if it's a rental house. It's just a business, right? And if he's got 10 oil wells, can I open 10 stores? Yeah, I'm smart enough to do that if I want to. And so the truth is, I don't have to say, well, you know, how come he, no, if I want that, I can do it too. And so can you. Any of us can. Maybe not that, but maybe something else. You know what I mean? But we have to take ownership of our own issues. Esau was saying, I'm going to kill my brother because it's his fault that I have. Wait a minute, Esau. Years ago, you sold your birthright to him for a bowl of chili. You sold it to him. He outsmarted you. Why? Because you were dumb enough to sell him your birthright. Don't blame Jacob for that. Who sold the birthright? You did. You're the only one that could sell it because you're the only one that had it. 
See, we like to say, oh, they make me so angry. No, they can't. Only you can make you angry. Right? I have a friend here today, Sister uh, Martinez. Hadn't seen these guys in years. They're visiting today. And her husband was blind. And uh, I remember years ago, we were in church, and he was a great guy. He always had a sense of humor. One day, I was walking down the hallway of the church, and I turned a corner, and he was coming the other way, and we bumped into each other. Just bam, bam, hit each other. And his name's Santiago. And Santiago said, oh, pastor, you look like you just woke up. <laughs> and I just laughed. I said, you okay? He goes, yeah, I'm fine, man. He said, he said, you don't look so good. I said, oh, I'm okay, you know. And I laughed, and I kept walking. There was a gentleman with me. And he said, hey, pastor, did that guy just say you look like you just woke up? <laughs> I said, yeah. He goes, well, that wasn't very nice. I said, oh, it's, it's fine. He goes, well, I, I think it's kind of rude. I said, no, he wasn't being rude. He goes, well, why do you say he wasn't being rude? I said, because I know him. I said, you see, he's blind. And if you bump into a blind guy, guess whose fault it is? <laughs> it wasn't his fault. And I said, when he said, Pastor, you look like you just woke up, either he just got miraculously healed or he was joking. I said, neither way. I'm happy either way. Amen. He went, oh. And I thought, he was, he went, he was going to be offended because he didn't know the truth. But Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will make you free. And see, Esau wanted to kill his brother. And his dad said, you know, you're going to have to work hard to get the things you have. But you're, you're going to be successful. And when you have dominion, dominion over who? Over yourself. When you finally start taking credit for your own problems, then you're going to break that yoke of your brother. You're going to quit blaming him for all your problems. And you're going to have success. And you're going to work hard to get it. But you're going to get it. And you're not going to be worried about what your brother does. You're not going to be blaming him for everything else. So many times we go to God and, well, God, how come that lady at work, that, you know, and not me? And how come that, that guy that lives down the street, but not me? And how come, you know, what about me? God? What about me? Hey, are you kidding? Quit worrying about the rest of the world and take credit for your own mistakes. Hello? Somebody say, what about me? See, that's what his dad told him. Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by the sword thou shalt live and shalt serve thy brother. And it'll come to pass that when thou shalt have dominion, then you'll break his yoke from off your neck. Son, you're bound up and you're going to be bound up until you finally get a hold of this thing. And you realize that you're responsible for your own actions. You're not, you're not overweight because obesity runs in the family. You're overweight because nobody runs in the family. And when you start running, you're going to lose weight. Hello. We have to take ownership of our own problems. Amen. But pastor, I was abused when I was a child. I was neglected. I, I was given up for adoption. I understand. We didn't have all the same start, possibly. But we have all the same opportunity. We all have 24 hours in a day. You have the same amount of time that Donald Trump or Bill Clinton or, you know, or Bill Gates. You know, we all have 24 hours in a day. The only difference is what we do with the time God's given us. Amen. We need to take credit for our own actions. And quit blaming everyone else for the choices we make. When you have dominion, when you dominate, in other words, when you take control of your own life and quit blaming everybody else, then you're going to have freedom. Then you're going to get the breakthrough. And I think Esau took his dad's advice. Because later on, Esau was coming to meet Jacob. He hadn't seen him for years. And remember, Esau said, when I, I'm going to kill that boy. That's the last thing Jacob remembered. Jacob left town, man. Got the blessing and ran. Go on, take the money and run. Ooh, yeah. You know, he was gone. And then he heard Esau's coming into town. He's got 400 men with him. Boy, Jacob was scared. Esau's coming to kill me. So you know what he did? He said, uh, send the children first. What a dog he, uh, Jacob was. What a sorry, no good for nothing. Send the kids. <laughs> send some gifts. Send some cattle and, and, and some sheep and they take some food to, to his soldiers and his men, whatever they are. And then let the kids go first. And, and then the women. <laughs> let, women and children first. I, I, I want him to get to them before he gets to me. I want him to be pacified by the time he gets to me. And so he did this because he was just the same person he always was. But Esau had grown. Esau had gotten dominion. And when Esau finally meets Jacob at this meeting, he says this in, in Genesis 33, verse 8. 
What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? He said, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. Now notice, Jacob calls Esau my Lord. In other words, I'm willing to serve you. You're better than me. And Esau said, look, I've got enough, brother. Keep what you have unto yourself. Wow, Esau finally got a hold of it. Esau finally got dominion of his own life. And he finally has started taking responsibility of his own actions. And he was blessed. Blessed with more than enough. His brother came and said, look, you can have all this. You can have all that. I know I, know I stole your blessing. You can have all these things. And Esau could have said, well, it's about time. No fair. You know, uh, that should have been mine rightfully. But Esau had grown up now. And he said, he said brother, I, I don't need your, your blessing. You keep your blessing. I'm blessed myself with more than enough. You keep all this stuff. I don't, I don't need any of it. I don't need your help. I, I, I got enough in to spare. Why? Because he learned the truth. And when you learn the truth, the truth will make you free. Amen. Well, thank you so much for watching the program today and watching it all the way to the end. Thank you for doing that. Listen, would you consider sending an offering in uh, to support the ministry here? Uh, you can simply mail uh, any amount to 940-241-4450. The number's there on your screen. 940-241-4450. You can just text an offering in of any amount to that number and we'll receive it. Of course, you can also mail your offering in. Our mailing address is uh, Christian Life Center, 806 Russell Palmer Road in Kingwood, Texas, and the zip code is 77339. Uh, you can also go to our website and uh, look around there. I think you'll enjoy it. You see our school, daycare center, and you can give. Uh, you go to clc-church.com at clc-church.com and just click on the Give button in the menu bar. Then the menu will drop down, and uh, you can give through PayPal that way. My favorite way for you to give is to come out and join us here in church. We're having services in-house. Of course, our chairs are socially distant, and we're sanitizing the building. We have sanitizing stations you know, for you throughout the building. And we have programs for your children, uh, for single adults, married adults, and kiddos of all ages. You're going to love Christian Life Center. Come out and be a part. We'd love to see you. And, uh, and just shake your hand if you, if you want to shake hands. Amen. Or just give you a nice fist bump and tell you that we love you. And thank you so much for watching. God bless you.